Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the re week before reading week. I know you're all eagerly anticipating next week. Uh, but before we go to that week and before we go to the rest of our day, let's take a moment to reflect on a word in scripture too often overlooked, just like the woman standing at the center. Please join me in a moment of prayer. God, I pray you be present in this place, that your spirit speaks to each one of us, and that this word may land where you desire it to be. God, thank you for your gifts, and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so you all got a stone. I want you to keep this stone in your hand or somewhere where you can reflect on it as you're reflecting as I um, preach this morning, thinking about where maybe you have been in this story. Because my guess is we have all functioned as different characters in this story at different times in our lives. The story that Kenesha read is probably well known. You've probably heard it before even if you've not heard it preached on very often. So Dr. Boberg and I talked about this the other week. We quickly refer to this story by saying, well, I'm not gonna cast the first stone, right? And we all know what that means. I'm not gonna judge first, right? So we just take the story as a caution not to pass judgment on somebody else. Oh, good, we're done, guess I, we can go. But I think when we do that, we overlook so much more that we could learn from this passage um, and we risk treating the passage in the same way this woman was treated. It's just an object quickly to be looked at, used, and then walk away. The story of John 7:53 to 8:11 is a scandalous one, a surprising one. And you might notice it's weird. Why 7:53 to 8:11? Well, this is because most scholars believe this is a later insertion into the Gospel of John. So if you have an NRSV or in most NIVs now, really most Bibles since the 1880s, have brackets around this story, or they put it on an entirely different page in your Bible, because we know it was a later edition. Which means some pastors say, oh, I can't preach that. But even though early Christians didn't always locate this story in the Gospel of John, we know that they were sharing it with one another since at least the second century. So it's really, really old and has been recognized as gospel by Christians for all this time, even if they didn't say it's from John. And with that in mind, and thinking about the living nature of scripture, I chose to preach it here today. John's story is weird. And we could focus on the woman's immorality, which is usually how I've heard it, I suggest to you there's another scandal present. Jesus is caught alone with another woman. He already did this once in the Gospel of John, which may explain why this passage found its home here. You remember back in chapter 4 when Jesus was in the Samaritan wilderness with this woman who had how many husbands? Five. And she's living with a man to whom she's now not married. And we don't know what her relationship is, but either way you slice it, she's a Samaritan, one. Two, she has a complicated sexual history. Jesus did not refrain from talking with her. He started the conversation. And at the end of the passage, we hear the disciples come back and they are scandalized. But they're too chicken to ask him, what the heck is he doing talking to this woman? He's about to do this whole thing again, but now he's not off at the well in some wilderness where only his, his disciples would be made uncomfortable. Instead, he's now in the middle of the temple. He's going to spend time with this woman in the public, and this is the sort of thing Jesus does and what he calls us to do. So imagine the scene with me just for a minute. We have at least four individuals and group characters on our stage. We have Jesus, the people Jesus is teaching early in the morning. We're told all the people come early in the morning, seated around him on the temple grounds. Then there are the scribes and the Pharisees, those people who should be teaching. And of course, the woman, who's there against her own will. Our narrator gives us some detailed stage directions, 
and some inner motivations of the people there. Jesus is sitting on the ground, which maybe sounds weird for us, but that's how teachers in the first century taught. The people came to Jesus and are listening to to his words, which makes sense, because where this passage is placed in John is during the Feast of Tabernacles. And it was during this festival that the scribes, the Pharisees, the religious leaders would reteach, in particular, the book of Deuteronomy, so that the people would remember their covenant obligations and how God rescued them from the wilderness and give them hope that God will be doing this again. The Deuteronomy connection is important because that's also the section from which the law Moses wrote about stoning adulterers comes. The scribes and the Pharisees, who should be teaching, have a different plan. They see this moment as a chance to get a public charge against Jesus so they can finally convict him of undermining Moses, the law, and the temple. This is the chance they need to get rid of Jesus. And really, it's so they can calm any nervous thoughts about those Romans that they might get suspicious Jesus is up to no good and maybe starting a revolution. They say, better that one man, eh, and maybe one adulterous woman, die rather than the whole nation. The scribes and Pharisees, they do a lot in just these short few verses, right? They catch a woman, they're leading her, they take her and they make her stand in the middle of all the people. And then they start badgering Jesus. Teacher, this woman has been overcome in the act of being adulterated. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone one such as this. You, therefore, what are you saying? You hear the challenge in these words. You also hear that my translation is a little bit different than the NRSV. But Jesus didn't respond fast enough. If you read verse 7 again, you see they're questioning over and over and over. That means they won't stop badgering Jesus. They will not let him continue teaching. In all of this, we might lose sight of the woman, or at least of her humanity. After all, She's on display. She's a silent object to be looked at, to be used as a tool, not a person. Take a moment to hear the verbs as I translated them that are connected to her. They're all in the passive voice, right? Which Dr. Cartledge tells you don't write in the passive voice. It's important though for us to see that they're in the passive voice. She has been overtaken, or she has been caught in adultery. She has been caught in the very act of being adulterated. And now she is forced to stand in the middle of the people. She's not a person. She's an object. The passive verbs probably surprise you. They aren't usually translated this way. Our English translations make us think she must be active in adultery. But the passive form fits the ancient context because in the Roman world and in Jewish context, women were not active adulterers. They were adulterated. This is because the perspective of the laws centered on the husbands. It is the husbands who were wronged when their wife was used to procreate children other than his own. So the laws are written in such a way, both in your Old Testament and in the Roman context, to protect the husband's rights. I will say Deuteronomy is much kinder than the Roman laws because there are penalties if a man should accuse a woman falsely. This woman is being adulterated. We have no idea what actually happened or if she chose it. For the passage, that's not the point. You should realize something's amiss in John 8 when the only ones who bring her forward are scribes and Pharisees rather than a husband, the one who would have been supposedly wronged with the law, and there is no male lover in tow to be punished alongside of her. 
Also, this is so convenient. This group of scribes and Pharisees, the, the passage before, has just been challenged that they need to find a public charge against Jesus. Nicodemus has asked them, don't we in our law, mustn't we hear the person's charge against them before we condemn them, right? Ugh, Nicodemus, you're a Galilean and a disciple of his, aren't you? Right? They dismiss him. But where this passage is now placed in your story, this woman becomes the answer for their problem, right? And it's so convenient. What were they doing? Were they lying in wait? Did they set her up? How did they catch her? We quickly assume she must have been having sex with a man who wasn't her husband, but that's not necessarily the case. Maybe she left home without a veil, even though she's a married woman, or the veil wasn't on quite right, or maybe she talked alone with a woman or with a man who was not her husband, which she's going to do again. Just as these religious leaders, the teachers of Israel, wanted to arrest Jesus without hearing from him, they now have captured a woman and seek to kill her without ever hearing her story. It's unfortunately a story all too familiar to many of us. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. What were you wearing? Were you drinking? Why didn't you leave? Well, what did you say? Living in a world that quickly assumes the guilt of those with black and brown skin, we see this all the time. What time was it? Where were you? But what was she doing when it happened? Even if beatings, shootings, and their resultant deaths are finally seen as murders, it seems like nothing changes before the next victim is placed on the stage. Women hear these words when they face harassment, words that gaslight their experiences and dismiss the trauma done. The implication of all these questions is the same. It's your fault. You should have prevented the comment, the touch, the harassment, the attack, and it does not matter that your adulterator is nowhere to be found. In the same way, the religious leaders of John 8 assume the woman's guilt. That's what makes her such a perfect tool. If Jesus grabs a stone, he risks setting off the Roman guards. Those soldiers who stand overlooking the temple from the Antonia fortress just overhead. But if he tells them not to stone her, Jesus disobeys, and more importantly, teaches disobedience to Moses and the law, and the teachers say, we've got him. They can confirm the charge they wanted to issue against Jesus the previous day. He is a deceiver. But Jesus isn't fooled. He knows their plot, and he knows the law. He turns the moment on its head by making the religious leaders and all the people the object lesson instead. Rather than focusing on the woman, Jesus requires everyone else to take center stage. First the Pharisees and the scribes as they keep on badgering Jesus to respond. In all that ruckus, everyone's looking at them interrupting and not this woman they placed in the center. Only after they've done that does Jesus stand. And now he takes up space. He draws the eyes to him away from the woman. But instead of condemning, condemning her, he issues his own command. Moses may have commanded this, but now Jesus is giving a command. The sinless one among you, let him throw the, throw the stone against her. That's his challenge. Throw the stone. But when you do, know you are claiming a sinless existence. You are claiming you never made a mistake. You are claiming, in this moment, you didn't bring a woman, put her on stage in the temple, publicly shame her, and seek her death, 
in order to enact a plot against someone else, against me. So now who's caught whom? Just as quickly Jesus sits down again and resumes his lesson, this time writing with his finger in the dirt. He draws their eyes down to him and then further into themselves. I always find it fascinating we didn't know what Jesus wrote. I can give you books on it. I can give you so many articles where people have debated what did Jesus write. Did he write the Ten Commandments? Did he write all the men's sins so they had to face him? Maybe he's just showing that he can write. I think all that speculation misses the point. No one's looking at the words Jesus is writing down because they have just been convicted by the words he spoke. In John 8, at least, everyone begins to leave. There's no longer a division of people versus scribes and Pharisees. It's just everyone having been made equal by Jesus' words. Beginning with the eldest, they leave one by one. That's a brave act. Because as each one walks away, they publicly acknowledge their own sin. And if any Roman soldiers were watching, they would have just seen Jesus diffuse a tense situation rather than start a violent insurrection. And Moses' law remains unchallenged and better understood. The sinless one among you be first. Let him throw the stone against her. Who will take up that challenge? Not even Moses could touch a stone. In all this, I want you to see that the woman's guilt or innocence is not up for debate. It's not even a topic of conversation. The leading, the steering, positioning, jeering, pointing are all stopped and silenced. One by one, the people leave until suddenly it's just Jesus sitting on the ground with his finger in the dirt and the woman still standing there, stuck. She was adulterated. She was caught. She was led, stood, accused, and still stands stuck in the place where the scribes and Pharisees have put her. The people may have walked away, but the woman is stuck. She's still living this trauma, still standing, not knowing how or where she should go. And that's what trauma does. It gets you stuck. Reliving past moments as though they are still happening now. From the outside, you may look completely still, but you're racing in your mind, experiencing anew the trauma that brought you to that place. And it's in that moment that Jesus is caught, alone with another woman. We know it's not the first time. Jesus isn't threatened by women not even those with bad reputations, those wearing the wrong things in the wrong places at the wrong times and with the wrong people. At this point in the story, he stands again. He stands beside her, not to walk away from her, but to speak to her. Looking her in the eye, he says, woman, not whore, not child, not adulteress, woman. Where are they? No one condemned you, did they? His questions are very simple, only six Greek words. Gunai pu eisen, ude se kate krenen? Of course, Jesus knows the answers to these questions, right? He commanded, they reflected, and they walked away. But Jesus asks the woman, and in so doing, gets her unstuck. For the first time in this story, she's the subject of an active verb. She speaks. You can see her blink, come into the present, and look around. Maybe she didn't even know everyone else was gone. You can hear her stutter, or whisper in disbelief. No, no one, sir. She only speaks two words in Greek, and one of them she's actually taken from Jesus, udes. 
Who des crier? No one, sir. Hearing her, Jesus speaks to her again. Neither am I condemning you. I can't convey the syntax well here, but the phrase is really beautiful. Ude ego se katakrino. Do you hear how ude sounds like udes from before? Neither. Jesus is putting himself with the no ones. Then he puts himself together with her, adding a pronoun he doesn't need to add. Ego. Ego, say. I, you. It's something like, neither do I, you, condemn. He stood up from the dirt and he left the stones on the ground. He didn't leave her. He speaks to her. He stands beside her in full view of anyone who might glance their way. And he gives her another chance to act. Go. And from now on, don't sin. So, huh, you're like, ha ha, we caught her. He said, don't sin anymore, right? So she must have been guilty. It's like we didn't hear the first half of the story, right? So many times I read commentaries or hear comments on this, well, she was an adulteress after all. Why do we do this? Are we the sinless ones? Not even Jesus condemns her, but we have no problem standing outside the narrative moment and condemning her ourselves. But it doesn't matter. In this story, the point is, she is free. Free from whatever sin committed by her and committed against her, and free from trauma's trap, invited to move forward of her own volition. We don't actually see her leave, though. The moment remains frozen. She's caught, and Jesus is caught. They are alone together, she with a man who is not her husband, and he with a woman who is neither mother nor wife. But this man tells her something different than all the others. She can go, but will she? Does she? Can she live without the burden of sin and shame? What will she and what will we do? We have a lot to learn from this story, but I'll just leave us with a couple things. First, notice Jesus' reactions. He does not abide by people using others as props. He draws attention away from the woman, onto himself, and then to his accusers until they leave. The religious leaders, scribes, and Pharisees are so concerned that Jesus' popularity will spell their doom, not because they are jealous of how big his church is, but because they are worried Rome will smell a revolt. But Jesus shows us no amount of self-preservation justifies the disregard of another person's life, perhaps especially when that person is powerless to stop you. Second, look at Jesus' interaction with the woman. He sees her. He helps her. He stands beside her. She is stuck, and he's trying to help her move forward. If you've ever experienced trauma, you know what that means. The message for you is that Jesus sees you. He rises to meet you, to look you in the eye, and to free you. You are not condemned. You are free. And you can go live fully with what, without whatever sin that haunts you, regardless of other, whether others realize that freedom or not. You are free. This, I suggest, is the real scandal of this story. It's not the woman's supposedly sordid history, or even Jesus' getting caught being alone with her at the end. It's the scandal he calls us to replay, to be free and to free others. Not to give in to the fears the world tricks us into of Rome peering overhead, armed and ready for battle. Fears that would pit us against each other, sacrificing one another for the sake of our self-preservation. Instead, we are to be free, to trust, to risk, and to love. 
This morning, you all took a stone when you came in. We all carry different stones. We carry the <laughs> stones attached perhaps to our sin. We carry the stones we felt pelted at us from shame. We maybe carry stones from trauma experienced. Jesus calls us to leave the stones on the ground. Today I invite you to reflect and as you do, make a choice if you will bring your, fo your stone forward and leave it here, or if you need more time, take it with you and reflect. I invite us to leave the stones and to go. I recognize that doing this once doesn't solve everything, but it's a start. And I hope that you can hear these words today. You are free. Be free. Amen.